Aloha, friends, and thank you for stopping by Brother Owl's Garden. I have a wonderful, wonderful guest who you've met before, Reverend Bob Belcher from the Big Island of Hawaii, and who also happens to be my very best friend in the entire universe. So welcome, Brother Bob. Love to have you here again. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha, my friend. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. My honor. I, uh, I, I wanted to talk to, to, because I had been on a spiritual retreat in um, November. That be was last November. Mm -hmm. And one of the guys that, one of the participants, there was about 100 of us, and he expressed that he had a fear of death. <clears throat> and I was mildly surprised because I thought that people who were studying spirituality or beyond the type of retreat that I was on would have already seen past that. But but people are who they are and they have their own fears and and you know it's 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 whatever it is. Um <laughs> I'm not afraid of death. I might be afraid of the process of getting there. Like <laughs> I like to be nice and sweet and gentle, you know, like like my dad. He, he checked out really real easy, you know, it was it was good for him. Um as my wife says, I don't want to die in pain or in fear. But uh, the but the death part, that's that's not an issue. I I'd had a series of out of body experiences. I'd mentioned this on other uh, other podcasts, and I've had the experience of being outside my body and and looking at my body laying in a bed and recognizing that the part of me that was perceiving the whole thing was standing at the foot of the bed, not in the bed or in the body, and so. I recognized that that I didn't have a soul, that I was a soul in possession of a body. So I've used this expression before. It may not be totally accurate, but it seems to work for me. You can't die because you were never born. You have body birth and body death. But you, the part of you, the part of us that, that makes up this experience called humanity is an eternal soul. It, it, it can't die. So I, I I fell across some notes that I wrote a while back, and I, and I thought I would just go ahead and share them if I can read them. My penmanship, fortunately, is getting better. But, <laughs> um, love is what makes life worth living, because love is the energy of the creative source energy that makes up the universe. We can't die because we are part of the fabric of what people call God. And what we are is individuated aspects in the consciousness of God. So we can't be separate from God. You don't have to search for God. You find it inside. And you can't die because you're part of what actually created everything. So the, the body will die. But the consciousness and awareness will live on. But it will morph. And I've used this analogy before. Think of being at home and you're at home and you have your home personality and your home friends and your home experience. And then you go off to boarding school. And when you go to boarding school, you will take on the persona of a student at the boarding school. So you got your school uniform. If you got one, you're living in a dorm, you're being a student, you're hanging out with your friends. And there's a persona that gets developed in the process of that. That's your school persona, your school personality. As you return home and that semester is over, you remember all the stuff that you did at school, but the personality goes back to the personality you had at home, enriched by the experience that you had in school. So there's a certain shifting or growth in that personality. And that's what this planet is. It's a school, an earth school for souls. It's, a, it's also been called a playground or a big video game. There's a lot of stuff to it. But... There's no point in being afraid of dying because the, the the process might be uncomfortable, but the actually death part, no big deal. We took care of, you remember Anne, we took care of my wife's aunt Anne for I guess like six years and she was in her mid nineties when she passed. And in the month before she died, she was going in and out of consciousness. She might be out for two or three days, and then she'd be back for an hour, and then she'd go out, and finally she went into a coma. 
and uh, for the last three weeks. But when she came out, when she was in her lucid periods coming out, Val and I had asked her, so where were you? And she says, oh, kind of surprised to be here. I, I was off visiting and talking with my mom and my sisters. They, who, and Anne's the last one of the family. So uh, she was having the experience of going home, visiting with family, getting things prepared, whatever that means, and then coming back here and waking up, telling us she was okay, and then she'd take off again. And finally, she, her her body died and, and she just went home. But these are experiences that let me know that there's no reason to fear death. As you know, uh, uh, my wife Valerie died when she was 16 and as a reaction to uh, a shellfish allergy, which is how she found out she was allergic. And she was resuscitated at the hospital. And, uh, but she had the experience of dying. She dropped dead at the admissions desk. So for her, she's not afraid of death because she's already gone through the experience and came back. So for anybody who is afraid of death, I, I understand it's from this perspective, it's an unknown. From the other side perspective, it's, it's a common thing we all do. And, and um, I thought I would add something that was written by Einstein because I have a friend who is a committed atheist and only believes in science, but he won't read any of the books written by scientists about spirituality. So I guess he just wants to hold on to his beliefs. But Einstein said, a human being is a spatially and temporarily limited piece of the whole, what we call the universe. He experiences himself and his feelings as separate from the rest, an optical illusion for his consciousness. So in a, that's the bottom line of it. You don't have to fear it. It's a natural process. It's just as natural as being born. And the problem is we don't remember being born. Or we don't remember taking on the body. And we don't remember that we already took have left them before. And we've done this hundreds, if not thousands of times. So just for anybody out there, if you are if you find that you're really afraid of dying, start finding uh, NDE reports on, on YouTube. There's There's a lot of them. There's so many people who have had near-death experiences, over 30 million in the United States. And there's so many, they actually have support groups in all the different cities because people are fundamentally changed when they go home and then come back and realize, oh, it's not quite what I thought it was. And um, so I told you it's going to be a real short comment, but that's really what it is. Well, Something that, first of all, I think that the fear of death, per se, is very understandable, even though, at least as far as we can be convinced at this point in our journeys, it certainly seems to be that we've done this forever, and and possibly we, <clears throat> you know, um, spirit, soul, uh, which is which is not incarnate tends to to want to come back to incarnation and after a while of being incarnated we tend to want we we yearn and want to return to disincarnation and so right. although it's not the necessarily the same meaning as the infinity symbol which is like an eight on its side right it seems that that's the flow it seems to go incarnation, disincarnation, incarnation, disincarnation. And, you know, we talk and you talked about going home and you mentioned about how uh, Auntie Anne, you know, was was making visits more and more back home before finally going back home. But another way of looking at it is that each incarnation and disincarnation are our home because you you are your home in the sense that one is not away from home the the spirit wants to incarnate and disincarnate 
and the body, you know, disincarnate from the body and back and forth and back and forth. And to the, to the extent that, as you mentioned in the, the boarding school example, it's not that uh, your time at the boarding school, meaning this earth in this body, right? It's not that that's lost or missed or misplaced time. No, no, no. Away from home at all. You, you are where you are meant to be doing what you are meant to be doing as long as you are present and attuned to the flow of life. And Correct. we've done this countless times and we probably have to do it countless more. <laughs> but um, I think- Well, it is all by choice. I mean, there's nobody telling you, oh, hey, you know, get on the bus and get back to earth. You got to go live a life. It's it, you choose to go and, and you, you make the contracts and agreements and whatever, whatever your guidance counselor tells you, you got to learn this time around. You know, um, I'm not sure about that personally. I, I think that sometimes we have, um, sometimes we can completely choose freely, whatever we want incarnate or not so much right now that kind of thing and then i'm not sure that and i'm telling you i'm not sure i don't know that in other cases there may be as you said guidance counselors someone else may say ascended masters whatever who who are in our soul tribe our spirit family who may say and now what your soul needs to learn from direct personal experience is this and so you need to go now and get your butt in school. I, I don't know yeah. if that's true. From my understanding, that suggestion might be made, but it's about free will. And so you can choose to incarnate or not. And so maybe, maybe there are suggestions or encouragement, but the decision is yours. Do you mean that? Correct. Okay. Yeah, that's what I mean. Right. Like you're not forced, you don't, you don't, you're not forced to do this. It's not right. like getting drafted. <laughs> I mean, and I know um, uh, my friend Rick would would chime in now and say that no entity has any right whatsoever to enter your space and usurp your free will and command you to do anything. And uh, he's quite the rebel about that. Um, we have this this iconic vision of, you know, for example, a glowing being of light comes and says to you, and you'll hear this in all of the NDE experiences that you talk about. There will always be somebody who comes and says, eh, not yet. You haven't finished your earth work. There's a difference, though. That's somebody who's already chosen to incarnate. They have an NDE experience and they don't want to come back. So, no, sorry. Basically, you made an agreement. So get back and get it done. Finish but if your you're earth work. In that, if you're there home already. There's nobody who look you up and say, "Hey, look, bud, it's your turn to to go oh, back I, to the." Yeah, but that's that's what I mean by the choice. Got it. Once you make the choice, you made a commitment. Got so it. There's a there's a soul contract or that yeah. that they talk about. Got um, it. Um, but he Rick would talk about um, he he mentioned a story to me about a friend of his who had an NDE. He, by the way, I don't like the term near death experience because you died. Yeah, it's a death experience. Meaning your body died. You you did depart your body. Right. There was death. So, but what it is, is we hear from the ones who came back. We we don't so much uh, hear as, as often from the ones who continued onward and did not come back to here. But anyway. There's, there's times when I have, but yes. <laughs> yeah. It should be called maybe like post-death, ex, post-death return or something. Anyway. Something. Uh, uh, there was a being that came to his friend after his friend had left his body and, you know, started as a pin, a pinhead of, of size of light, pinpoint of light and came up and was this glowing white being. We might say an angel and uh, said, you need to go back. It's not your time. This is not for you now. You need to go back. And he and, and he did. But then Rick would say, well, who are you to tell me? There's only one of us here. <laughs> so I can understand his point too, 
you know, in the sense. I that, yeah, in the sense that but, we are all fragments or expressions, individuations of the one. But exactly. Yeah, just the interesting, interesting percep differing perceptions. The the thing about it is, is that we we get on the planet and we get these bodies, and the bodies just can't remember what the what the other half was, what the other other experience was. And um, Valerie and I were talking, and we're talking about um, the body experience. And later we, we came across some writings and some lectures on this, but we were talking about it going, well, the body has a certain, uh, I don't want to use the word karma, but I can't think of a better word. There's things that are inherited in a body. There's things that come through a family. There's, yeah. there's physical issues, maybe some psychological issues. And when the soul comes in and pairs up with it, these two things merge. And and so there's that's how you get this familial karma, say things within a within a family, but the the soul entity, the soul personality, sought out that family and that body and that experience to deal with the kind of lessons that it needed or wanted to learn. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I've heard a couple of people describe dying is like ripping Velcro, that that you know it just rips off and and there you go. Other people say there's no sensation at all. Other people, we talk about a slight tearing, but they're not. It's nothing to be fearful of. You know, we, we forget that we've done this hundreds, if not thousands of times. Right, right, right. Well, you know, Bob, uh, people, there's a lot of people who say, well, part of the process of coming here or coming back here is that you get wiped so that you can have genuinely this direct personal experience oh, absolutely yeah. because uh, uh there's there's um an old man i know here in thailand that uh he, he says he's a rishi and he told me when we talked about this topic it is actually not only undesirable it is not only probably counterproductive but it is potentially destructive to know all about the totality of who you are and who you have ever been before coming here because it would totally debase or undermine your ability to have a direct personal experience and and in other words it would it would uh, short circuit the individuation that it's, seems to be necessary. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And it's like, um, it's going to be like going to school and you already know all the text anyway, so why bother? You know, yeah. you, it's, it would destroy the, the experience of the person having, you know, who is here because they're here to learn yeah. or they're here to play. And yeah. the thing is, in, in either case, if you have this vast knowledge that's just normal in your, in our normal state in, the, in, in spirit, if we have that vast knowledge available to us here, there would be no point in playing the game. There'd be no point in going to the class. There'd be no point in the lesson because you would know it. I right. think what it is, these lessons, there's, you have to learn it experientially. You can't read in a book and say that you know you 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 know what you read in the book, but you haven't had the experience, right? And I that that each lifetime we grow and learn, and I think that it, that allows us to learn more. Just like in grade school, you know, you every knowledge is built upon knowledge, yeah. and I think that same process happens within a, a spiritual context, uh, right? I, I think it's the same, and that's and based on talking to a lot of people and reading a lot of books and and uh having a lot of experience yeah um, and, and yet bud it seems it seems also on the flip side we arrive here as an already complete being and then we assimilate into our new identity 
the ego intellect, the self, the persona, as is arguably necessary to function in this realm, this yeah. simulation, this matrix, this earth school, this triage, whatever you want to call this planet. Okay. And then we sort of lose ourselves in that for, you know, 20, 30, 40 years, whatever. And then it whatever. seems that that earth, I mean, that life on earth tends to start to curve back toward a remembrance and a re realization and returning back to the true essence, nature, and being of who we actually are, and of course, have always been and will always be. So it's sort of like we take the plunge, you know, like a kid at a pool, one, two, three, boing, dive in. And for the first half of the dive, you go deeper and deeper and deeper into the water, meaning the development of your persona here, your ego, mm. intellect, identity, personality, etc. And then at a certain point that kind of starts to shift and you begin to rise back up and come up at the top for a breath of fresh air. And we could think of life as being taken a dive in the pool. And then you come back up for a big gulp of fresh air. Maybe that's another valid metaphor. Well, it's, it's one that I can relate to. I spent, about 45 years in the water. You know, right. As a surf a diver. Right. And boy, were you wrinkled. Surfers. Pardon me? <laughs> and boy, were you wrinkled. I was wrinkled. I'll <laughs> tell you what. <laughs> Brian, one of the things that I think is so important about your platform is that I know you have a time consideration. So let me just kind of finish it off with this, with this thought. People who have attained any level of awareness, any knowledge of, of these esoteric concepts of these, uh, I'm almost reluctant to say, but those who are, who are awakened. I feel that we have a responsibility to help other people awaken. And we can't wake them up. That's not, that's an individual thing. We can provide a framework for them to awaken into. We can provide books and teachings and say, look, read this, read that. Let's listen to this guy, listen to that one. Meditate, find your own answers. Uh, you know, don't believe me, that's my experience. You know, but consider that these things actually exist, that this is, there's so much more in the thing that I'm, I have become so aware of is there's so much more to life than living. There's so much more to this experience and what we're seeing. Um, religions barely scratch the surface of it. Mm. And you've heard me um, use the uh, uh, metaphor of Mauna Loa. And that's that here's the largest active volcano in the world. It's 14 feet, 14,000 feet above sea level, give or take. From sea level to the ocean floor, it's three miles. And it's so heavy, it's crushed in the ocean floor another five miles. So there's yeah. eight miles of mountain that you can't see that holds up 14,000 feet that you can see. And I believe that that's the same as it is in, in the relationship to the physical and the spiritual. Yep, it's like an that, iceberg. Yeah, that, that little bit that we call life, that we call this planet, we call the stuff that we see is supported that 14,000 feet that we experience, we think that it's all it, is actually supported by eight miles that we can't see. Let me please add something to that because it fits perfectly. It, it's a perfect setup. I've, I'm in the process now of coming to a realization about the layers and degrees of the self. And, and by the way, I've studied none of the Hindu Vedic uh, spirit science on all of that. I know that it is there. I know it exists, but I've studied none of it. So I may or may not overlap with any of that. But the point sticking out above, let's use the iceberg, okay? The, the little point that's sticking out above the ocean, we'll call that the conscious mind. And, and right. in there is the projection of self, identity, etc. And it's just a fragment 
of the entire entity. And below that, we go down into emotions, we go down into the unconscious mind. And I, again, this is unfolding to me now, these days, recently. I think that what we call the unconscious mind at, at a certain depth is soul. And I think that at a deeper depth than that is capital S self. So that I, what I we may I, call our higher self is actually the connection. You know, you, you know the uh, Michelangelo painting with with uh, the hand of man and the hand of God. And by the way, please note that the the finger of God is reaching out and offering, and the the finger of of man is unsure and sort of non non committal. That's very poignant in that painting. The offer of absolute connection is there and from the from the side of universal source all god it's it he's reaching and extending firmly out and from the side of the incarnate self forgetful disconnected being that we tend to be if we lose track of things that that the finger is sort of well maybe so but i think that these degrees of being, you know, you have the, the conscious, the projected self, the consciousness, and then the emotional layers, which is like the lid on top of everything that of the issues. And then into the unconscious at a certain depth, I think is what we call soul. And then I think below that, or at a certain level of that is where we are inseparably eternally connected in self. That is where we are all one in that level. And I, I just wanted to share that because it's not, it's a work in progress. Okay. I'm not, I'm not there, but it's where I'm at right now in my understanding as it unfolds to me. What I do know experientially is that love is the connector for all of it. Yeah. Love is the energy of it. And the more that I study, the more that I experience, the more that I just live. Yeah. Uh, it's it's all about love. It's all as Brother Ed said, it's all about love. And, yeah, but what uh, about evil? Yeah, not enough love. <laughs> I had to let you get that in there. You had to. Thanks. Yeah. Um no matter what religion any of our viewers might be coming from, no matter what background or tradition or understanding or absence of all of the above, you may be coming to this discussion with, with, uh, with me and Bob. No matter how you currently understand or don't, God, please, as one grain of absolute immutable truth, Always remember that no matter what you want to call God, God is pure love. From that, we can all agree. And I do acknowledge Neil Donald Walsh for making that point in The God Solution, the, the book that um, he shared on, on this platform with us. You can look for it earlier in the uh, videos. And and I, I, I think that, again, no matter what you're understanding which will be incomplete and probably incorrect in some ways and no matter what your religion which will be incomplete and possibly incorrect in some ways about what you believe which does not mean it's true god to be that is the inter the intersectionality of all that god is pure love and we are from that we are of that. We are made of that. We are that. And so, yes, we are here entirely for the agenda and purpose of love. That's why we're here. A lot of people today think we are here to, um, well, the purpose of my life is to be happy. Eh, not really. Uh, the purpose, purpose of my life is to feel good. Say again, please. 
That's not a purpose. That's an experience. Yeah, it's actually a result. <laughs> you know, yeah. But uh, oh, I'm here to be happy. Well, I hope that you can be happy as much as possible. But it's not why you're here. And oh well, uh, the the whole thing about my life is to feel good all the time. I just as long as I'm feeling good. Really, you know, we're we're here to love, and to grow in love and to expand in our self awareness, meaning capital S, our awareness that we are the self that we have originated from. We are an, an expression of the Godhead. Oh, I don't like oh, all the religious stuff you're saying. Okay, pure love. Don't, don't get caught up in labels. Labels come from our side of things, incarnate, individuated on the earth in bodies, in groups called cultures, societies, traditions, and, and, and in periods of time that may or may not relate to the one we're in right now. So that stuff all comes from this side, but pure love, eternal. Timeless. Pure love. It's, um, uh, and, I, and I think I'll sign off with this one. Uh, one of my mentors many years ago um, said, you don't really have to understand it. You just have to get it. Understanding yeah. the movie prize. You don't need to understand water in order to get wet. <laughs> or to jump in and enjoy swimming. Yeah. <laughs> have a good splash. You know, um, a final thought uh, that I, I would offer is to the people viewing this video who we, we might define as materialists, people who believe that all of that spiritual stuff is bunk, it's all nonsense, imagination, stuff that's made, made up to make you feel more comfortable, etc. For those who believe that the body is you and when you die, that's it, you're dropped in a hole and you don't exist anymore. Many of the people who who do not have the spiritual connection or understanding or resources to look to in, in the event of the fear of death, which I do think is understandable because we do it's forget. Unknown. Yeah, it's well, we, and we forget. We mm -hmm. forget, oh, that's right. I've done this countless times and I never died and I don't die and I won't. I just keep forgetting that I'm not this body. I've come to associate so deeply with this physical vehicle I occupy and this realm that I navigate through that I forgot that this is the glove, but I am the hand. Okay. So for those yeah. who believe that, you know, uh, when the body dies, that's it, you're done, you're dropped in a hole. And yet they are also afraid of death. Well, because it's nothing for them, literally. Well, but what they're afraid of is the experience of non-existence. After I die, it's just black. There's nothing. And there's also not you. But if there's no you, there's no experiencing. And if there's no experiencing, why are you afraid of experiencing non-existence? Right. You either continue or you don't. So for those that you know, have the materialist view and, and, and also the maybe unconscious dread of dying with a materialist mindset, you, you should have a very big laugh at that fear when you realize that that fear is the fear of experiencing not existing. It, it's I, not I, possible. As, as I told a friend of mine as well, if you don't, you're, you're going to be really surprised when your body dies and you don't. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. And remember also, in conclusion, that if after you leave your body, you find yourself drawn to the light, it could be that you have reincarnated as a moth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's leave it there for now, Brother Bob. And thank you so much for popping in and visiting us. And I hope that what we've shared today truly and genuinely 
dismisses the fears that most people have. I mean, the fear of death is second only to the fear of public speaking. And uh, you and I both have enough experience in that. We're We're over that. (laughs) Yeah. So I hope that we've helped. I hope that we've helped you today to our. I hope so. And, and um, you know, please, if, if you have a fear of death, just enjoy your life and, and have fun with it and be good to other people. Look up the thing we did on the five values, values of civilization, apply that to your life and your family. You'll have a happy life. You'll be productive. You'll enjoy yourself. You'll learn all the lessons you got to have. And, you know, Better luck next time <laughs> or not. You know, enjoy yeah. your life. Just we, enjoy it. We come here to heal. We come here to learn. We come here to release. What can I release? Did a, did a video on that. Um, and to return to the realization, remembrance, and, and, and being that we actually forever are, have been, and will be. And will be. Aloha, my brother. Aloha, brother Bob. Love you. You too.